بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So um, apologize for the a uh, little bit of a late start. That's kind of standard here at MCC now for me. But uh, uh, also, uh, hopefully, inshallah, I don't fall asleep here. Um, you know, one of the topics that we'll talk about uh, in the course of our conversation today um, is that, you know, all of us, before we are, um, you know, whatever work we do, whatever professions we have, uh, after basically being slaves of Allah um, and being believers, the, the next thing is often, uh, you know, we, we play a role in terms of our families. Uh, so myself, you know, alhamdulillah, aside from being a son, also a husband and a father as well, um, so I actually flew in this morning, but uh, both my daughters weren't uh, feeling too well, you know, just kind of the, the bug kind of going around. And uh, so I was up pretty much all la- up last night and then uh, came here this morning and then khutbah. So, um, and then after khutbah, they took me to RJ's. So after that, there was a food-induced coma. Uh, so I li- literally, I think Arib had to like resuscitate me. Um, so he had to basically bring me back to life and so I'm, I'm sitting here right now without any coffee in me so make dua everything goes well inshallah because it could go very well or it could go very bad so it just really depends um, but the topic uh, for today was faith and community um, and, and I, I'm gonna you know uh, I'd like to just explain this topic to you uh, through a story uh, through something that occurred within Islamic history but I'd like to also set the conversation up before we go forward. Struggling with one's faith, with one's iman, is something that is a natural consequence and a result of one's environment, surroundings, influences, atmosphere. We're human beings. Allah created us as social beings. And one of the very interesting opinions, the word insan, the word insan, it comes from the root word which means what? Very good. A lot of times people think forgetfulness, nisyan I heard. That's, that's actually the minority position amongst the linguists. As Brother Bilal pointed out, it actually comes from the root word which means to, companionship. To be emotionally uh, affected. Al-mu'anasa, al-unsa. To be emotionally affected, to be affected by one's surroundings. And so a human being is extremely malleable, is, is very deeply affected by everything that that human being experiences. And so there are so many different things. What, what we are surrounded by, what we hear, what we watch, what we listen to, what we're told, what we read, it affects us at an emotional level, psychological level, social level. But what sometimes I think what we fail to understand is it also has an impact on us at a spiritual level. It also has an impact on us. And that's something we have to be very conscious and aware of. But at the same time then, there's got to be some type of a solution to deal with this crisis of faith. To borrow a term from the Christian community, the crisis of faith, which we realize is not that alien to us as well as Muslims. We're seeing it happen all over our communities. Younger people are a little more prone to it or maybe are a little bit more willing to express it and show it or talk about it. But it's something that everyone across the board deals with. But then what is the solution? So in order to explain that solution, I'd like to share a story with you. The story is about a young boy from Persia. His name was Salman. And this young boy from Persia, you know, he, this man named Salman talks, tells his own story personally. First hand he tells his story. He says that he was the son of the leader of his people. Kind of the mayor of the town, the leader of the tribe. He was his son and he was his only child. And he said his father was very overly protective. Very overprotective. To the extent, and he actually gives this example, which again, because of the cultural background of many of the folks here, they might be able to relate to this example. He says, my father was so protective of me as people would be of their young daughters. And that kind of gives you an idea from a cultural perspective what he's exactly trying to communicate. 
that as a boy, as a young man, I didn't work, I wasn't told to go out and make a living, I wasn't taught any type of a trade, I was told to just stay at home. And he said there was only one responsibility that I had. Because I used to be home all the time, I used to do a lot of reading, and naturally the thing that our people were very dedicated to was our religion. We were Majusiyun, we were Zoroastrian, we were fire worshippers. And so I was very committed to the religion because that pretty much was my only activity, my only outlet, my only social outlet. And he said, I had a responsibility. My responsibility was because my father was the leader of the people, attached to our home was the place of worship, was the fire that had to constantly be maintained, had to be rekindled all the time and be maintained. So that people would come there and, you know, basically worship there at that fire. And so he says that my father had given that to me as a responsibility. Since it was attached to the house, he said, you look after the fire. And morning and evening, I would go, I would check on the fire and make sure everything was good. And that pretty much was my life. He said until one day, my father was a businessman as well. And, you know, he was kind of overwhelmed with a lot of his business obligations. So he asked me, he said, I need you to run an errand for me. At the end of the day, I was like, you know, a teenager. I was, I was a young man. So he said, I really need you to do, I really need you to take care of some things for me today. I can't handle it by myself. I got a lot of deadlines and I need your help. So he sent me on an errand, but he sent me on a very specific errand. He said, I want you to take these goods. I want you to deliver them here. I want you to pick up the cash from there and I want you to bring it home. But that's it. I want you to go there, make the exchange and come right back. That's it. So he said, I was really excited, obviously. It was my first time out, kind of doing something like this. First time my dad had trusted me with something like this. I was very excited. So I was going about my way, and I passed by a very interesting looking place. It wasn't a home. It didn't look like one of our temples. It looked interesting. And what it was, was that it was a church. There was a monk, there was like one singular Christian monk who lived in that area. And he was trying to, he was a missionary, he was trying to propagate his religion amongst these folks. And that was his, that was his little monastery. That was a little small church and monastery that he had. And I saw this place and it looked kind of interesting, so naturally my curiosity, you know, was piqued. So I looked inside and I saw that there was a group of people who didn't look like they were from around here and they were all worshiping inside. And even when we read the book of Allah, when we read the Quran, we find out that Christians, even in their origins, had a prayer that was very, that resembled our prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, وَاسْجُدِي وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ Ya Maryam, uqnuti li rabbiki. Wasjudi warka'i ma'arraki'in. So it was obviously some type of worship that must have been very much in line with the proper way of worship for them at that time, pre-Islamically, from the Christian tradition. And he said, I was intrigued. It seemed interesting, but it also seemed a lot more meaningful than what I was used to. So I walked in, I asked them, who are y'all? What are y'all doing? And they basically invited me and they were very hospitable, they were very nice. I, find it, I ended up finding out that these were folks who were from uh, Roman territories, which later on he would find out that they were from the Syrian region. That was a Roman territory and it was Christian land. So they were businessmen who were kind of passing through there and this Christian monk, being you know Christian brethren, he had kind of opened up his monastery to host them there and they were worshiping, they were Christians. So he said they invited me in, they gave me food, I sat down with them, I kept asking questions. I was like non-stop, just asking questions, asking questions. And they kept answering all my questions. And I was so intrigued, I prayed with them. Until it was finally evening, I didn't realize hours had gone by. And then all of a sudden I ran out and I took care of whatever my father had told me to do and I came home. But by the time I came home, I was basically a few hours late. And you can imagine a very overly paranoid father, as the way he described earlier, his dad was waiting outside. He said, where have you been? What happened? Who did the what? what? Did you get kidnapped? Did something happen? Where have you been? And he said, no, 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 nothing was wrong. I was actually, 
you know, I, I was going and I saw this place and I stopped to worship and pray and I was just, I was amazed. I was blown away. It was fascinating. Dad, wait till I tell you. And immediately he shut me down. He said, no, no, you stop. Stop right there. You need to stop all this nonsense. You're never going back there again. In fact, you're never leaving the house ever again. You're going to be quiet. You're going to shut up and you're going to go back to your routine. So he said that I had discovered something that I could not contain. So I sent a message. After all, young person, young people are pretty resourceful. Parents know that. All right. And so he got a message to those folks there through some friend or someone. He was able to send them a message saying that I want you to notify me whenever you are leaving and going back to wherever you came from. Let me know. Give me a heads up whenever you're about to leave. And so after a few days, he received a message, a notification from them saying, we're going to be heading out tomorrow morning. And so he said, this is my opportunity. So he packed up his stuff. Middle of the night, he slipped out. Went and joined these people and set out with them in the morning. And he asked them, he said, take me back to your lands, wherever you're from. And take me to someone who is a teacher of this religion so that I can learn. And they took me back to wherever they were from. And there was a major, there was a priest, there was a monk in that area. And they said, he's a major teacher of our religion in this area, in this region. So he says, I went there and I basically presented myself to this priest. And I said, I just want to be your student and learn from you. I'll do whatever work you need. I'll learn my way but I need to learn. So he said, sure, come on, you'll just, you'll, you'll, know, you'll be my assistant, you'll work here, and I'll teach you along the way. But he goes, something bad happened along, I started to learn a little bit about the religion, but something went awry, something went wrong. He said, I found out that this priest was very corrupt. He was stealing money from people. Basically, he would raise money for donations, charity, and things like that, but he was embezzling these funds. He was stashing all this money away that he would collect from people, he wouldn't distribute it. So he said, I watched for as long as I could, I stomached it for as long as I could, and eventually I was like, I can't take this any longer. And he said, one day, just when I was at my wit's end, some of the people came and got kind of upset with him. So what's going on here? We think something's up, something's shady, we don't have a track, any type of record of you giving any money out. And I saw that other people were realizing this, so I said, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Let me show you. And he said, I took him around back, and I said, dig over here. And they dug, and they basically dug up all the money of the people. And he said, these people were furious. He said, I didn't realize the repercussions of how angry they were, but he says that they basically ended up hanging this priest and torching the entire church and monastery and just burned it to the ground. And he said, I was not only traumatized, but also kind of, I didn't know where to go, what to do. So I set out again, looking for someone to learn from, somewhere to learn. I was looking for the truth. But now I had an experience, I had a little bit of a filter. I knew what to look out for. So he says, I found a very pious, knowledgeable, you know, priest. And I went to him and said, I'd like to be your student. I'd like to serve here at the church. And I just, I, I just want to learn. I want to serve. So he said, come on. And I served as his assistant. I was working, cleaning, helping, serving, but then learning. And this man, he says, was truthful, honorable, pious, he was everything that I hoped for in a teacher and a mentor. And he taught me well and I stayed with him. He was an old man. I stayed with him for a number of years until he was very ill and near death. And I asked him, I said, what should I do? If you die, where do I go? And he gave me the name of another priest. He said, go to him. He's legit. I'll vouch for him. So after he passed away, he says, I went on to the second priest. And then 
he was an old man. I stayed with him as long as I could. When he was about to pass away, I said, all right, make a recommendation. Yeah. Refer me to somebody else. And he referred me. And he said, I went through about two, three preachers like this until I finally came to the last one. And I stayed with him for some time. And when he was an old man as well, and when he was near death, I asked him, where do I go now? And he said, this last one was very knowledgeable about the scripture and the original scripture. And he said, there is nowhere else to go now. The time has come for the prophet of the last times. Nabiyu Akhir Zaman. As their scriptures would call the Prophet ﷺ. The prophet of the last time. That the time for that prophet has come. And he said, well, I can tell you a little bit about him. Let me give you three ways that you can identify him. And he told him three things to look for, which we'll talk about. And then number two, he said, where can you find him? He said, I don't know a lot. My knowledge does not extend a lot to in terms of where he's originally from. But I can't tell you that there a time will come in the life of this prophet where he will be ousted by his people. And he will go and settle in another location. And that will become the base of this religion and the teachings of this prophet spreading all over the world. And I can describe that place to you. Those, that scripture I have found and I have read. So I can describe that to you. So he says, you know, he describes the place to him, date palms and trees, and he describes the climate and the, the agriculture of the area and the region and things like that. Everybody see this right here? This, this is what keeps it going, all right? So, but, so he says, I can describe those things to you. And he basically described the city of Yathrib al Madina al Munawwara. So Salman al Farsi radiallahu anhu says that after this preacher, this priest, he passed away, then my life mission and objective became to find this place. So I had a little bit saved up. Obviously, I was the, the student of a preacher. All right? So imagine, you know, the situation of imams a lot of times. And then imagine the assistant or the student of the imam, right? So he says, I was miskin. I didn't, I didn't have a lot. So I had a little bit and I was trying to, you know, hitch a ride in that direction. And I came across a business caravan. And they were, they were not good people. So what they ended up doing was they saw a loner traveling by himself didn't really belong to any family or any tribe or anything anywhere. So they said, yeah, sure, we'll give you a ride. And the second I wasn't looking, they chained me up, they tied me up, shackled me up, and tied me up with the rest of the slaves. We just got a free slave. That's 100% profit. So he said they enslaved me, wrongfully. They enslaved me. And they took me along with them. And they sold me, they got to a marketplace, and it seemed like I had reached the region of the Arabs, and then they sold me there. The man who ended up buying me, after some time, gave me as a gift to his cousin. Because his cousin owned um, date, you know, uh, date orchards, basically. Gardens full of date palms. So he gifted me to his cousin. When, when I was transported to the cousin's garden, as I was arriving there, I looked around, and it seemed really familiar. It seemed just like that place that that preacher had described. And I got very excited. And I thought to myself, this is not an ideal situation, but by the will of God, you've ended up here. So just lay low, bide your time, and let's see what happens. So he said some time went by and I was patiently waiting. I would pray, I would worship, I would ask Allah. And I was just waiting. And he says one day, I was up in the trees, kind of, you know, cutting off the dead leaves and, you know, plucking the dates and just kind of maintaining the trees. I was, so I was up, climbed up into the, into the date palms, into the trees. And this owner, the master, one of his friends ended up coming over saying, man, have you heard what's going on? We really got to figure this situation out. There seems to be like some type of political shift going on here in our city. 
This man has come from, from Makkah. His name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He says he's a prophet. There are hundreds of followers of him already in our city. And this and this and this and this. And he it describes the whole situation. Salman radiallahu anhu says, I was listening to all of this, and I almost fell out of the tree. Like I got so excited, I almost fell out. And I immediately climbed down and I said, whoa, 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 what was it? What were you saying? What were you saying? And he says, the owner, the master slapped me and he said, mind your own business, do your work. So I said, okay, no problem, I'll, f I'll figure things out. So he says, after hours, once the work was done, in the evening time, I came out from the garden. I asked around, there's somebody, some prophet, somebody's arrived here in town. And the prophet Wasallam was still at Quba. That was the suburb of Medina where the Prophet ﷺ stayed for about a week on his way to Medina. He was still there. So I found out that he was there. I didn't have a lot, I was a slave. You don't, I mean, when you're a slave, you're a property, you don't own anything. So he said, but I was able to scrounge up just a little bit, like some dates together, make a little basket, like a little fruit basket. And I went out to see this Prophet, and I walked up to him and I said, you know, um, Sign number one, that my teacher had taught me. That this prophet, when you give him, when you present to him charity, sadaqah, something meant for the poor, he will not eat it himself. He will not take it himself. He will simply take it from you and distribute it, but he himself will not take any of it, consume any of it. So I said that, I see that many of your followers are poor and needy. Here's a little bit of charity for me. So he said, I saw the Prophet ﷺ took the basket, called up some of the more needy amongst the Sahaba, and gave it to them. And he said, I sat at a distance and watched. He did not take a single date for himself nor for his family. He just gave it all away, distributed all of it. So I said, okay, number one. I went back, it took me a couple of days. Some of the narrations actually mentioned it took a couple of weeks because he was a slave. So by that time, the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina now. So he said, I scrounged up another fruit basket and I go back out, sign number two. My teacher had taught me that this prophet, he will accept gifts, he will partake of the gift himself and share it with others. But he does accept gifts and take partake from the gift itself. So I took another fruit basket and I said, this is a gift for you. You're... You know, you've arrived in our city, consider it a home, you know, home warming gift. And so, here you go. A house warming gift, here you go. And I gave him the basket, and I again sat at a distance and watched, and he, he took one or two dates, said Bismillah, he ate him himself, himself, and then he distributed it to everyone and shared it with everyone who was around him. Sign number two. Once sign number two was confirmed, then there was only sign number three remaining. And sign number three was that the Prophet, this man, this Prophet will have the seal, the mark of prophethood between his shoulder blades, on his upper back. And it's described as almost like a cluster of moles that will be in, on his upper back. So that is the third sign. So he goes, then I kind of slowly, casually, discreetly, I kind of moved around back behind the Prophet, to where I could maybe see his back, but the problem is obviously, you know, I mean, he was, he was dressed appropriately. And one of the, one of the ways that the Prophet ﷺ would dress is he would have a lower garment that was tied around him, kind of like what a brother wears in ihram, in hajj. He had a lower garment tied around him and he would wear like a shawl on top, kind of cover himself up, just kind of throw it on top. And he was wearing that, so I'm standing behind him kind of doing this and doing that and trying to see if I can get an angle, and it's not going nowhere. He says after a little bit of time, just a minute or two, the Prophet ﷺ says, you're looking for something, aren't you? Without even turning back looking at him, he's really looking for something, aren't you? He, so basically he's like, you know, I was trying to be slick, but I wasn't slick enough. You know? So he says, you're looking for something, aren't you? Is this what you're looking for? And then he kind of lowered his shirt, if you will, just a little bit until I could see the seal of prophethood. And he says, the second I saw it, I ran up and I hugged the Prophet ﷺ from behind. And I said, I've been looking for you my entire life. I've been looking for you my entire life. 
You're the truth that I've been searching for. And I accepted Islam and became a Muslim on that day. <coughs> finding faith. Finding faith. There's something that I have to say here. And my purpose of saying this is not to be insensitive. My purpose of saying this is, Allah knows best. May Allah forgive me and protect me from such a thing. But at the same time, hopefully, my intention here by saying this is not to be judgmental. Not to be harsh, not to be mean, not to be judgmental, not to be critical. But it's for us to reflect. Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu found this truth through a lot of adversity, a lot of difficulty, a lifetime, enslavement. I mean, think about what he went through. Think about the sacrifices he made. Think about the, the battle scars that he had to show for afterwards. What he had been through, where he had been, what he had seen, what he had experienced. But the key element of it is, is that he didn't just wake up in the morning and this truth was just magically like sitting in his lap. He didn't just randomly just look one day and it was like, oh. It required some work, some searching, some digging on his part. And he found it. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an. وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ anab. Allah will guide. It's a guarantee. When Allah says something in the Qur'an, it's a guarantee. Allah says He will guide. The one who turns to Allah with his heart, actually goes looking for the truth, yearns for the truth, desires, wants the truth. We have to ask ourselves a question. All of us, at our own level. But particularly, my brothers and sisters who might struggle with faith, might struggle with, but how do you know it's true? Might struggle with, but you know, I read, I learned this in science, and I learned this in high school, and I learned that in college, and they were saying this in philosophy class, and they were saying this in science class. Like, how do I, how does that make sense? How does it all fit together? How does it all come together? Uh, I'll share with you like a personal story. Someone that I know personally, a young Muslim, came to me, um, this was probably, I think it's almost been a year now, came to me about a year ago, and there's a lot of stories like this, but this one particular story I'll mention, because this is somebody I knew personally. I knew the family. So this person, 21 years old, young, bright, intelligent person, very, mashallah, very intelligent, a lot of potential. Grew up in a good home, good family, you know, went to the masjid, the, the weekend school, the whole, you know, the whole shebang. All right? This person basically was sitting here about three years into college saying, I don't know if I believe anymore. I don't know what I believe anymore. This person was studying, you know, I think they were, they were a biology major or something like that. And just... I'm reading all this, I'm, re you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking into all of this, I'm hearing all of this, I'm finding all of this, and I don't know if Islam makes a lot of sense. I don't know if I can believe in this stuff anymore. <coughs> and I asked this person, because I knew them, I asked them a very honest question. I knew this was a smart, intelligent person who would think about what I was saying. I asked them, how long have you... Okay, so it, it, for that person particularly, science was kind of the issue. So I asked them, I said, how long have you studied science? Let's just say, you know, elementary school, middle school, whatever. You're still a kid, you're still running around doing your thing. So from high school, you start to kind of study a little more seriously. So you studied four years of science in high school, three years of science in college, this is your major... You have seven years of an education in science. How much Qur'an have you studied? Now, I'm not asking. I ask that person to ask themselves. I ask myself, I ask you all to ask yourselves. How much Qur'an have I studied? Have I read the translation of the Qur'an even once in my entire life from cover to cover? Have I actually sat down and tried to understand the Qur'an? 
Have I made any effort in that regard? Second question, have I read, studied the life of the Prophet ﷺ from cover to cover? Even once, have I read an entire biography of the Prophet ﷺ properly and reflected on it? In the case of this person, which is the case a lot of times unfortunately, the answer was no. So I said you have a decent level of knowledge and understanding in one area. And on the other hand, you have little to no knowledge or understanding. But yet you're making this comparison and you're basically coming to the conclusion that one is correct and the other is incorrect. Does that sound intelligent to you? Does that sound academic? Does that sound intellectually honest to you? I said no. So I said, here's what we're going to do. You have questions, I'm not, I'm not dodging your questions. You have valid questions, you have every right for your questions to be answered. But I'm asking you to do some prep. You know, even when you, when you go and you talk to experts of any field or any area, they say, you know, the best questions are the, the intelligent, educated questions. People who actually go and learn and study and do some research before they come and they ask you a question. That's an educated question, intelligent question. So I said, why don't you just go do some research so you can ask better questions. Gave that young person a translation of the Qur'an. Gave them, you know, recordings of our, some, uh, what I could personally vouch for, were some of, you know, our own tafsir recordings. Gave that person a book on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah. At the same time, I also have a weekly seerah class and seerah recordings and gave that to that person and said, here you go, just engage in the study. Very objectively, you can completely disagree with me if you want to, but just study, do some research. And I said, six months, the next six months, this is your project. This person wanted to kind of touch base with me after a couple of weeks. I said, nope, I'll ask you how you're doing, how's the weather, I'll talk to you about the game, Last, no, actually, I won't talk about the game last Sunday, but uh, uh, stop it, all right? I'm still kind of sensitive, okay? So I was actually like, I, I love the community, I love teaching, but I was dreading coming out here. I hate you people so much. So, Redskins fans. So, but I, um, so I said, I'll talk to you about anything else, but no updates. No, 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 just take time, take time. You know, kind of sink your teeth into it. And so, finally, three months later, after holding this person off from any feedback, three months later, this young person says, problem solved. I'm good to go. I feel like I just now discovered my religion. I feel like I just became Muslim. I actually believe now. I actually believe. So, my first point is this. I was presenting this from more of an intellectual perspective. Maybe somebody's got some questions or doubts about Islam, when they compare it or pit it against, you know, some other intellectual, you know, discipline or some other field or area of study, whether it be philosophy or science or an, another religion or whatever the case may be. I actually had one time, and again, I'm not belittling this, I'm just presenting the reality. I had a young Muslim person come up to me one time and said, I read the entire Bible. And now I got questions about Islam. I asked a very honest, straightforward question. It's going to seem like a put down. It wasn't. It was an honest, sincere question. I said, very good, mashallah, good, everything. And I just asked, have you read the entire Quran translation completely in its entirety? No. I said, then you need to do that. You owe that to yourself. If, if, the, if, the, if the quest is for the search, if the objective is searching for the truth, then why would you sell yourself short? Why would you sell yourself short? So read, learn, discover. You know, this past weekend I was on a panel at a retreat, at a conference with um, this one very interesting brother. He's a chaplain 
He's a Muslim chaplain at a university. He's a PhD candidate, has a master's degree in religion and uh, philosophy, a very educated person. But he converted to Islam and kind of had this whole very interesting journey through Islam. Um, and um, he just kind of put it out there. He just kind of laid it down. Working with young people, constantly dealing with this question. He said, enough of the abstractions. Enough with the abstractions. Read, learn, and then question. That's, that's, that's just honest. That's just integrity. That's just doing justice to yourself. Do yourself a favor. Read, learn, study. And there's two things that I will emphasize. Everyone study. Number one, Learn what Allah has revealed. Learn and understand what Allah is communicating and saying to us in the book, in the word of Allah itself, what we call the Qur'an. Learn the Qur'an. Study the Qur'an. Develop a relationship with the Qur'an. Just explore, learn, study, understand. And the second thing is, the life, the seerah, of the, the biography of the Prophet ﷺ. Learn, read, and study. You owe that to yourself. But like as, as I was saying, I'm presenting this from an intellectual, uh, like maybe somebody has an intellectual crisis of faith. Sometimes people have a, an emotional crisis of faith. We had a lot of young people at that retreat last weekend. Somebody sent up the question, again, my, my purpose is here is not shock and awe. I'm not a shock jock. But I'm just presenting. We had, I actually, we, we in, in a panel... In, in, a, in, a, in an actual session, we received not one but multiple questions from people saying that they were sexually abused by family members. One person saying, I was sexually abused by my father. So maybe somebody is having a severe psychological, emotional crisis of faith. Now again, I can't even begin to imagine how difficult that must be. But I will say this much, that again, unfortunately, very unfortunately, and our heart goes out to you, we console you and embrace you as our brother or sister. But for yourself and for your own faith, again, read, learn, study, and discover what Islam really is, because what you've experienced up to this point is not Islam. I feel very confident and comfortable saying that much. What you've experienced up to this point is not Islam. It sucks that we have to make that distinction between Islam and Muslims. You know that's the answer we always give to non-Muslims? Oh brother, that's, that's Muslims, not Islam. That is like the worst answer of all time. But the problem is it's the truth. But how terrible is that that we, have to, we actually have to say that? But nevertheless, what I say to that person is, Learn, read, discover, and understand Islam. So maybe somebody's having their, their crisis of faith is based in a bad social experience, a bad communal experience. God knows that's a reality in our communities today. May Allah help us all. But the plight and the state of our communities a lot of times? SubhanAllah. So maybe that's the reason why you've ended up in this crisis of faith. Again! Again, that's not Islam. I'm very sorry. I'm, ex I'm very, very sorry that that's what you went through and you had to experience. But that was not Islam. That is not Islam. Read, learn, and discover Islam for yourself. And that will happen through a direct interaction with Allah through His Word, His Kalam, the Qur'an. And the only human being that we can 100% vouch for in saying will never disappoint you and that is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi Why? Because Allah vouched for him. He called him Uswatun Hasana, the ultimate role model. So learn and understand and read these two things. But as the story of Salman al-Farsi shows, the truth will come and find you. But you gotta go looking for it first. Allah will facilitate it. Allah will not make us go through enslavement and a lifelong journey that Salman radiallahu anhu had to, the Prophet ﷺ actually praised that quality of Salman. The Prophet ﷺ said that, لَوْ كَانَ الدِّينُ بِالثُرَيَّةِ 
that the Prophet ﷺ actually said that if Islam was to be found on another planet, Salman would have found a way to get there. Salman would have been the first astronaut of all time. That's the, 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 the desire for truth that Salman had. But that's why he found that type of truth as well. So that's the first thing. But the story doesn't end here of Salman radiallahu anhu. The story continues on. This is my very humble but personal message to each and every single person, to myself and to each and every single person on an individual level. Read, learn, understand, and educate yourself about your religion, your deen, your faith. You owe yourself that much. But at a communal level, what is our responsibility to one another and to each other? Let's learn about that. So Salman radiallahu anhu says, now I'm a Muslim. Awesome, fantastic, great. But there's a little bit of a problem. I'm also a slave. Which means I am someone's property. Which means that I can't go to the masjid five times a day to pray. Because I'm owned by someone. I'm someone's property. I can't just get up and walk out. He'll torture me to death. So I can't go pray five times a day with the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid. The battle of Badr happens. Great landmark moment in the history of Islam. And he says, I had to miss out. Because I was a slave and my slave owner was like, are you crazy? No, you're not going. Get back to work. Then the battle of Uhud came. And whoever was too young or was not Muslim before Badr, everyone saw Uhud as their moment to redeem themselves. To make up for a lost opportunity. And he said, again, I tried to go for Uhud and my slave owner was like, you must be crazy. I would rather kill you than let you go out and fight in the battlefield. I'd rather have the gratification of killing you than somebody else killing my slave. So again, I didn't get to go for Uhud. And I was tortured by this. So he says, finally after the battle of Uhud, I go to the Prophet ﷺ and I say, Oh Messenger of Allah, I can't deal with this no more. I'm missing out on everything. So the Prophet ﷺ said, why don't you go and talk to your owner, your master? There is a process that was there at that time in Arabia called mukataba. What it basically meant was, I will, as a slave, I will earn and work my way to my freedom. I will get money and I will buy my own freedom from you. Called mukataba. So the Prophet ﷺ said, why don't you go and try to work out a deal with your owner? So Salman radiallahu anhu goes to this owner and says, I like my freedom. Now this guy decided to kind of play with him, toy with him. He goes, you want your freedom? Sure, why not? Absolutely. All it's going to cost you is 300 date palm trees. Like 300 date palms. 300 trees. Even in today's world, that's crazy expensive. So 300 date palms, trees, and, and it's like he says he like randomly just picked a number out of his head, 40 grams of gold. So 300 date palm trees and 40 grams of gold. There you go. If you can come up with that, guess what? You deserve your freedom. So go now. Get back to work. Salman radiallahu anhu says, the next time I saw the Prophet he said, okay, Salman, what happened? Did you talk to your owner? And he says, I was very shy. Because of the price. But the Prophet pressed. He said, tell me, what did he say? So he said, a messenger of Allah. And he said, I didn't even tell him the full price. He said, he said uh, I have to give him, plant for him, 300 date palms. Not just give him 300 trees, but plant those trees. And the problem with that is when you would transplant these trees, many of them would die, would become damaged. So I want 300 trees planted properly. And he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I can't afford that. So I'm just going to go back to life the way it is. The Prophet wasallam gathered everyone together. It was time for the adhan, time for salah, everyone congregated. He said, get everyone together. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is your brother Salman. He needs y'all. Help your brother. Help your brother, all of you. So he said, sahaba started standing up and saying, 
I'll give 15 trees. Somebody stood up and said, I got 10 trees, I'll give them all my 10 trees. Somebody said, I'll give five, six, seven, eight, one, two, one. And he said, everybody started basically, it was like a fundraising. Everyone started making contributions, making pledges. Until Salman radiallahu anhu says, we reached the number of 300. Then the Prophet sallallahu said, okay, everybody go and dig out your trees. And he sent another group of people. It's not just, okay, everybody just bring all your cash, bring all your money, and then here you go, it's your problem. No, no, no. Now we're going to do all of this together. So one day, all the donations are raised. All the trees are gathered together. The next day, the Prophet ﷺ said, now everybody go out into that slave owner, his field where he wants these trees planted, and everyone turn the soil and dig the holes to put down the trees. Everybody do it. So the whole community now on day two is working in the fields, plowing the fields, plant, you know, digging holes for trees. The whole community. And it's all done in a day. And then the Prophet ﷺ told them, nobody put any of the trees in the holes. When everything is ready and done, I will do that part. And then the Prophet ﷺ came and Salman radiallahu anhu says, it took an entire day, 300 trees. That we would come, we would give the tree to the Prophet ﷺ and with his own blessed hands, he would put it into the hole. And kind of scoop some dirt into it and then he would tell us, all right, now pack it up. And he would do each tree with his own hand. And he said, because of the blessing of the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, not a single tree was wasted, not a single tree was damaged, not a single tree died. And all 300 trees were planted. And then the Prophet ﷺ called me and he goes, here you go Salman, congratulations. But he said, I knew in the back of my head, wait a second, 40 grams of gold. So he said, I kind of had a little bit, I, I, he said, I had no intention of telling the Prophet ﷺ. But I didn't know what to do then. So I just kind of sat there, but I had this look on my face and the Prophet ﷺ said, what's up? There's something else. And he said, I was so embarrassed and shy, you know when you don't even say it out loud, like, yeah, just, uh, so he said, what, 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 tell me. He said, oh Messenger of Allah, the dude wants 40 grams of gold. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, said, I just received this as a gift. Somebody sent this or brought this as a gift. And it was still wrapped up. The Prophet وسلم, hadn't even opened it and looked at it yet. It was just like, like a gift bag. It was still gift wrapped. He just took it and he said, here you go, take it to him. I mean, I didn't have any other better options. He said, I didn't even open the gift bag. I just picked it up and went over there to the slave owner and I said, your 300 trees are planted. <coughs> Jerk. And, <laughs> and then, here's the second part of the price. He says in front of my own eyes, that man he unwrapped the gift and inside was this big old chunk of gold. Unlike anything I'd ever seen in my entire life. And he said he actually pulled out a scale, like a weighing scale. And he put it in the scale and he weighed it. And Salman radiallahu anhu says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, it was exactly 40 grams. Exactly. On the dot. And he says, that was the day that I became a free man. And he said, my next opportunity to do something, you know, make a stand with the Prophet ﷺ was the Battle of the Trench, the Battle of Khandaq, where an army of, an allied army of 10,000 strong had sieged the city of Medina. We were looking for some type of a defensive strategy because we could not go and fight 10,000 people out in the open. It, it just, it wasn't a good idea. So everybody was trying to figure out what to do. And I stepped forward. Now who is this guy? He's a foreigner. He's not, he doesn't belong to anybody else's like family or race or ethnicity. He's a foreigner, he doesn't have any family. He doesn't even speak the native tongue or the native language. He's a more recent convert. And he's a freed slave. 
When you talk about being disenfranchised from society, from community, a freed slave. What is the country? What is the history of this country in terms of when slaves were freed? But then, how long after that were they still continued to be treated not only as slaves but as as second class citizens as well? And some would argue that it's still not even gone till today. And I would have to agree. So. Think about what his position is in that society. He steps forward. All the major Sahaba, everybody, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhum, they're all there. And a lot more others of their caliber are there. And this foreigner who speaks the language with an accent is a recent convert and a freed slave actually steps forward and says, I have an idea. Number one, that tells you that the community of the Prophet ﷺ was such, everybody was welcome and everybody was an equal participant. Everyone had dignity and everyone had honor and respect. It didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter where you came from, it didn't matter what color you were, it didn't matter what social class you belonged to, what your personal history was, everybody had dignity, honor and respect and equality in that community. That he actually has the courage and feels it appropriate for him to step forward and say, I have an idea. Like, can you imagine somebody? Like, uh, imagine somebody that w- didn't belong to any of our backgrounds or ethnicities, like an Eskimo. Right here in the masjid, an Eskimo would stand forward and say, I have the good idea. <laughs> I mean, exactly. You know, I know it's kind of like all fun and games, but that's what, exactly what we do. We'd be like, oh my God, is that an Eskimo? Hey, ask him where his igloo is, right? And, and I mean, we would laugh at his accent. We'd be like, what is this guy talking about? Brother, how long have you been here in the community? No? Okay, shut up and sit down, right? I mean, just think about our reactions. He steps forward and voices his opinion. And the Prophet ﷺ gives him the floor. He says, yes, go ahead, present. And he says, we need to dig a trench. Now this is where it gets really crazy. Not only is he, is he um, you know, quote unquote, an outsider, nothing in common with anyone, but even the idea that he's giving is like bizarre. It's something that the Arabs have never seen or done or heard of or read about, nothing. Digging a trench as a strategy of war, it's like unheard of to the Arabs. So he's like, okay, we're going to dig a trench. They're like, a what? A trench. A what? We're basically going to dig a big hole around Medina. Everyone's like... But at the same time, his opinion is given respect. It's considered. Just as valid as anyone else's opinion. And the Prophet ﷺ takes his opinion and decides according to his opinion. And then on top of that, well nobody knows how to dig a trench. The only one who does is Salman. So guess who's leading the project? Salman. Now he's project manager. He's on the board. Leading the project. Like, who put that dude on the board? Like, seriously, her? He's on the board. He's leading the project. And then I'll end with this one last little instance. The most beautiful culmination of all of this, which really seals the deal, that it goes even beyond embracing someone as a member of your community, but it goes to the extent of embracing someone as a member of your family. Treating each other like family. Where the Prophet of Allah وسلم, told people, kind of distribute yourselves according to your, we need to make groups to dig, like from here to here, from here to there, kind of segment off the trench, and then just, just split yourselves up. You know how you say just everybody just kind of pair up into groups? The second a teacher says pair up into groups, naturally who do you pair up with? Yeah, your friends, people you have something in common with, something you, somebody you have a connection with. So the Prophet said, just split yourself up into groups of ten. So naturally, people started to split up according to family. And cousins, and uncles, and nephews. They just naturally started to split up that way, because those are people you know. But now there was a little bit of a problem. Salman radiallahu anhu is kind of looking around. Everyone's kind of with their family, and their cousins, and their brothers, and their neighbors, and this and that. 
and he realizes he kind of doesn't belong. So some of the muhajirun, they step up. The people who had migrated, the people who had come to the city of Medina as Muslims, said, Salmanu minna al-muhajirun. Salmanu minna. Qal al-muhajirun, Salmanu minna. The, the muhajirun said that Salman is from us, he's with us. Because why? He came here for... He's not originally from Medina. He's from somewhere else. He moved here to Medina. He's an immigrant, just like the rest of us. The Ansar said, no, 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 Salman minna. Salman is from us. Why? He did not come here as a Muslim. He accepted Islam in Medina. He was living in Medina before the Prophet ﷺ came here. And if we're going to consider the Hijrah, the marking point, then he was already here before Hijrah. So he is one of us. What would we do if again, I go back to my uh, example of the oddly speaking Eskimo, right? If we had to make groups, we had a community project, we were going to do a community potluck, we were going to play some type of a game here in the masjid, and we had to split up teams. Brother Eskimo, everybody would be trying to pawn him off like, hey, don't make eye contact, dude, he might come over here. Right? Like, hey man, you guys take him. No, you take him. Why do I gotta take the Eskimo, man? <laughs> right? Like, everybody would try to be pawning, trying to pawn this guy off to somebody else. But the Prophet of Allah, but look at the community of the Sahaba. They're all fighting for him. Saying, no, he's with us. No, he's with us. By the battle of Khandaq, the Sahaba had enough tarbiyah. They had enough Islamic uh, training by the Prophet ﷺ, enough spiritual mentorship from the Prophet ﷺ that they have been taught one very important thing. To not take unnecessary, frivolous issues to the Prophet ﷺ. Don't bother him with silly stuff. He's the messenger of God. Don't bother him. That doesn't mean that his door was closed, his door was open. But the Sahaba were also taught, don't constantly bother him with silly nonsense. But this became such a serious issue amongst the Sahaba that they had to take it to the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger of Allah, we got an issue. We want Salman with us and they say, no, Salman's gonna be with them. The Prophet ﷺ made the decision. He said, Salmanu minna ahl al-bayt. Salmanu minna ahl al-bayt. That Salman will be with us from the people of my family. Salman will not dig with the muhajirun the immigrants, he will not dig with the Ansar, the locals. Salman will dig with my family. Why? Because he's a family member to me. He's one of my people. Come on, buddy. You're with me. You're with my family. This was the communal aspect of Islam. How this ties into our conversation about faith, that individually, like I said before, read, learn, and educate yourself. Explore, discover, enlighten yourself. And number two, the responsibility that we owe to one another is to embrace each other. To have respect, dignity, and honor in our communities for every single person that walks through those doors. Everyone is dignified, everyone is respected, everyone is treated, not just as a community member, but as a family member. When we can afford that type of love, that type of respect, that type of affection, that type of an experience of community, a lot of these faith-based issues will be resolved. Why? Because by that communal, family-like experience, the faith and the iman of a person is fortified. It is strengthened. It is solidified. And that's what we desperately need today. That's what we have to learn a lesson from. That's what we have to take into consideration. We all need to reflect at the current state. I talked about earlier in terms of our own understanding and not just knowledge, but an understanding of our religion. How well do we understand? And then number two, we all have to take a serious look at ourselves and at our communities and at the culture, at the very least in the community space 
in the masajid, in the Islamic centers, at the very least, ideally, our homes would be open to one another. Think about the disenfranchised in our community. Think about what they deal with. Think about what they go through. I talked about this in my own community this past uh, Eid. You know, Eid is like the most awesome time. It's the most wonderful time of the year, right? So, you know, you know, Eid is like amazing. We all look forward to Eid. Nice clothes and nice food and all family and friends and everyone getting together. Did you ever talk to a convert brother or sister? Eid is, is the most miserable time for them. It's such a difficult time for them. Because everyone, they come to the salah, and everyone's excited, and everyone's happy. And then everyone retreats back from the salah to their parties, to all their fun, and they're just kind of left standing there. Without really anywhere to go. Without anyone to spend that day with. That's just one example. Think about at how many levels. The racism in our communities. Even the, I mean, I, I, was, I was kind of reading some comments from uh, a couple of brothers and sisters, a couple of students, online even. Even the way we talk to each other, the comments that we make to each other about race, about color, about ethnicity, about language. Do we ever understand how hurtful and harmful that is? Would we talk to a family member like that? The way we deal, we interact with each other, the honor, the dignity that we, can, that we extend to one another, regardless of a person's background. Look, nobody in this room is an angel. Everyone's got a background. Sometimes some people's background might be a little more visible than yours is. Your sins, you might have just been a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit more sneakier with your sins, which actually makes you a worse person than somebody else. But just because somebody else's sin is known to us, we hold that against them in the way that we treat them when they're trying to make a better person out of themselves. And I mean at so many different levels, I can't even do justice to all the different segments in our community that are so terribly wronged in this regard. One thing that's come to light recently, you know, a lot of times when folks, particularly sisters, if they go through a divorce, they're treated like lepers in our community. Single parents, single mothers are left to fend for themselves in our communities. We really, really have to take a look at ourselves and understand where we're at as a community. Where we're supposed to be, where we need to be, where we got to work our way towards, but where we sit right now, where we're at right now. And things have to get better. We have to improve our own state for ourselves and for the sake of the community. And when we're able to employ these two things, when the understanding of our religion is something that is advocated and made available, which by the way, the communal sense, the communal responsibility also extends to the first one. Maybe somebody doesn't have some resources. That one story about that one young person I told you was knew me personally and was able to come and talk to me on a personal level. What if they don't know somebody? What if they don't know where to go to? They don't know who to talk to. They don't know where they can get some help. They don't know where they can get some good material. We have to facilitate that learning as a community. And if we're able to put these two pieces together as we see from the story of Salman al-Farsi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, then inshallah we'll be able to improve um, things and be able to work our way back in terms of this crisis of faith that we're dealing with at the same time. Um, again, as you know, Brother Arib mentioned, um, there's two things. I, I always like to try to give something tangible that you can take home or some type of homework for everyone. Um, I talked about learning two things and enlightening your, yourself in two areas. The Qur'an and the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ. In terms of the life of the, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, the prophetic biography, get a book. Read a book. You know, with all the electronic devices that so many people have these days, you know, the, the, the Kindle store, even if you don't have a Kindle device, you have an Android device, you have, may Allah forgive you, by the way, if you have an Android device, and if, if, you, if you have an Apple device, like an iPhone or an iPad or whatever, there's a Kindle app 
There's an app that you install, that you download on there called the Kindle app. You can buy it inside of that app. The books on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, one written by the author Martin Lings. Another one written by um, uh, another scholar, al Mubarak Furi, called ar rahiq Al-Makhtoum, The Sealed Nectar. You know how much these books cost in the Kindle store? 99 cents each. May Allah bless the soul that put them on there for 99 cents. So for this, you could buy four seerah books. Astaghfirullah. So, but, so, may Allah forgive Brother Arib. So, um, hey man, I didn't buy it. So, but, uh, I drink it. But, uh, so, that's how easy it is. Secondly, if you want something that's a little bit more engaging or easier or facilitated for you, a personal project that I embarked upon two years ago was... Taking, the, taking about 15 classical sources, because some of the, the classical sources on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the majority of them have not been translated into the English language yet. So I decided to take about 15 classical sources and start surveying them and reading them and researching them and presenting the life, the seerah, the biography of the Prophet ﷺ in detail. This started about two years ago. And it's ongoing. And it's a local class that I conduct in my community in Dallas. But what we do with that class is we record it. And then we make the audio recordings available online for free. Open. No excuses. Why? Because every human being deserves to know who Muhammad is. What he means to us. What we can learn from him. And so it's very detailed. We have, I think I've done about 45 sessions. Each session is about an hour long. And we've reached um, the fifth year of prophethood. So the first 45 years of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and 45 hours of lecture. But this is all available online, open for free. And I'm going to give you the, the, the place where you can go to download it and then share it. Do whatever you want with it. Just, just make some benefit and some use of it. Go to qalaminstitute.org That's Q-A-L-A-M Institute dot O-R-G slash podcast. And you can subscribe. You can download. It's in iTunes as well. So as if you search in iTunes for Qalam Institute, Q-A-L-A-M Institute, you'll find it. But no excuses. And then the second thing about building a relationship with the Book of Allah, with the Qur'an, similarly, we have our tafsir recordings and our tafsir podcasts as well, on the Bayina website. B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H dot com slash podcast. Where you'll find plenty of recordings on the explanation of the Qur'an, which can get you started. Pick up a translation and read a translation. Start somewhere. And inshallah, one tangible um, you know, means that we have is that tomorrow inshallah, here at uh, MCC, I'll be teaching a course, a class on the understanding, the meaning of Surah Yasin. Surah Yasin, the 36th surah of the Qur'an, the very famous popular tafsir, uh, Surah Yasin. Inshallah, we'll have a class tomorrow starting at 10 a.m., going till 5 p.m., on the meaning and the understanding of Surah Yasin. Start somewhere. Start chipping away. And this is actually the Qur'anic philosophy on how to study the Qur'an. Tanzeel al-Aziz rahim Tanzeel. Little by little, bit by piece, chunk after chunk. Take piece after piece. And slowly start to increase your understanding of the Book of Allah. And tomorrow... We'll spend an entire day, inshallah, studying the beautiful, powerful meaning of this magnificent surah. So inshallah, please try to make it out and join us. If, you've, um, if you want more information, those flyers that they've passed around, the red and white colored flyers, you'll find all the information that you need on the flyers, inshallah. And number two, maybe some of you have registered online, so you're aware of the details of the class. 
If you want more details in regards to the class or even sign up and register and secure a seat for the class tomorrow, there is a registration table in the back where you can stop by on your way out, inshallah. And I really hope um, you know everyone's able to make it out tomorrow. We can spend the whole day just learning and exploring the meaning of this powerful surah, this beautiful, magnificent gift and treasure from Allah. Insha'Allah. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, Tayyib, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. I want to appreciate uh, everyone from uh, for coming out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.